Hello everyone, how are you doing today? Thank you so much again for joining me on another fantastic episode of That Proud Black Woman Show. How is everybody doing? I hope you are having a fantastic, fantastic weekend for me. I'm currently at a barbecue, which I'm going to be enjoying at the end of the day. And I hope you're doing something nice for this uh, long weekend. For those of you here in Toronto, uh, or in the GTA, I would, uh, you know, there's a lot going on, a lot of carnivals. It's the uh, Caribada weekend as well. So for those of you that will be showing up there, you know, make sure you have fun. Enjoy, take nice photos and post it. Tag me if possible. Let me see how you're enjoying your life this weekend. Okay, so a lot of you have been asking me, why is it that you always only bring women to your show? Is it because it's called That Far Black Woman Show? And I'm like, no, not really. It just happened to be that most of the people I reach out to, the women are faster to respond. <laughs> so I have listened and I am bringing your way a very, 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 very fantastic guest this time around. And believe me when I say fantastic, I never bring anything but the best on this show. So who are we having today? I'm going to read you a little bio about this person. So you know the quality of guests that I have today. So his name is Efodo. He's a partner at Praxis and Gnosis Law in Nigeria. He has obtained his Bachelor of Law from the University of Abuja and Master's Degree in, the, uh, in Law from the University of Oxford and Osgood Hall <laughs> Law School, respectively. That's impressive, quite impressive. He has gained advocacy and programmatic experiences from working across several countries and supranational legal systems. He is a World Economic Forum expert on human rights. Whoops, that's awesome. And has lectured and published widely on the subject. So you've been wondering, who is this person? Don't worry, stay tuned and I will uh, introduce him shortly. <laughs> Hello, hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm such a fan. Now I can't believe I'm actually here joining you live. Uh... <laughs> that, that's awesome coming from you. If you say you're such a fan, I'm like, mm, okay, okay, okay. I mean, it's not only it's not only black women that you inspire. You inspire black men as well as women and men, boys and girls uh, of all colors, races, shapes, and sizes. I mean, to be honest with you. I am really impressed with the way that you embrace your heritage, your history, um, your profession. You know, in the various ways you've talked about breaking barriers and shining in every way and form. I mean, look at you, look at me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so yeah, exactly. That's the point of the show, right? Like, we should always, like, I would say, like, uh, some three, four years ago, before the pandemic, mm -hmm. all the news we heard about Black people is usually the negative, the negative part. But then if you look into it, we all have like really beautiful achievements that no, nobody is celebrating. Like what's wrong with us? Nobody's going to do that for us if we don't bring it to the fore ourselves. So we spread the that proud black woman. You have to be proud, not only in your skin, but in your achievements and put them out there. And who else to come and tell us about your achievement? If not you, like you're awesome. Like I've been following you for the longest while. And I've been seeing all the things that you achieve. And let me just say, I also have a, a master's in international human rights law. Awesome. So, okay. <laughs> I have not been practicing, but it's something that I really want to do like long term. But you know how human rights is. Sometimes you have to think about the money part as well. What will bring food to the table before you I follow know. your passion? So I know. So. <laughs> I mean, they always say human international human rights law is not where you make the millions, even though that is changing. Mm -hmm. But I can tell that you live by the principles of human rights. In fact, it reflects in your work, it reflects on this show, it reflects in your job as well. So you don't have to practice it day to day like I do. Um, you're living through it. So that's amazing. That's awesome. Thank you so much. For well, those of you joining us today, you know how we do. The OGs on this show, you already know how we do. You have to make sure that you represent yourself in the comments section. Where are you watching us from? Are you in Toronto? Are you in another uh, province? Are you outside of the country? Just rep yourself in the comments section. Let's know where you're watching us from. So now I like to start with 
yes, I read your professional bio. That's professional. That's what <laughs> you want people to see. But I want you to give us something else, something more interesting, something not too professional that people don't know about you. I mm. want you to talk to us about that a little bit. <laughs> There are so many things people don't know about me. Um, I mean, I was born in Nigeria, grew up in Nigeria. Um, I think as a kid, I had all kinds of ideas as to what I wanted to be in the future. At some point, I wanted to be a nutritionist. At some point, I wanted to be <laughs> an, an astrologist. Uh, but, you know, kids' dreams and all. But, um, yeah, I found myself in the legal profession. It wasn't like my childhood desire. Um, I just knew I wanted to, just like you say, dare to be different. I wanted to solve problems and, you know, I found my way towards law. Even though I dabbled, I tried a couple of other things before I found myself here. I know it looks like, oh, I planned it all the while, but absolutely not. You know, trial and error, circumstances and chances all sort of aligned together to bring me here. But other than that, I love food. I love a good time. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a proud black man exactly and, and even though i recognize the problems that we have as men not responding quick like you mentioned earlier i'm learning and i appreciate the support and the resilience of black women that has actually helped raise black men like myself so just to you and everyone else absolutely okay that's awesome to know uh, for some of us, I know, as you said, when you're uh, little, you think about so many things. I want to be this, I want to be that. Today, you want to be a policeman. Tomorrow, you want to be uh, <laughs> uh, an astrologer, as you said. Yeah. But changes. Funny enough for me, as when I was growing up, my dad's older brother was, was a lawyer. And he always made it so attractive, even from when I was three years old. And I wanted to be a lawyer because of him, just because... I like the regalia, I like the way he carries himself. I'm like, no, I have to be a lawyer. And it's so funny that I actually did stick to that. I yeah. remember every time they're having a thing called, uh, I think it was called a um, uh, law year or something like that. It's a celebration that happens every year. Yeah. So come pick me and take me to the celebration and it was fine. So I always wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't get the chance. I think my childhood was still in a way. I didn't get to change my mind as to what I wanted, but... You know, to God be the glory, we're here today, and I'm happy that I'm also able to practice law now in Canada, so that's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mine was the opposite. I think I grew up as a child in Nigeria. We lived opposite a magistrate court, so every morning, there were these, like, Black Maria, these cars that came in with uh, uh, petty criminals, and I just hated the carriage of the lawyers they felt very very wow. they felt like mini gods <laughs> and i was just like why are these people acting this way but i was very troubled by people who were always charged with like petty offenses like stealing theft you know little, little things like that and i wondered why are the big people not um being like paraded like this exactly. and i remember my, my dad telling me that the law my dad he was actually very you know, he said the law is like cobwebs. They don't attract big cows, sacred cows, but they can capture spiders. So I was like, okay. That's awesome. So I, to find myself practicing law, people say, well, it's always been there. You've always lived around the law, but um, I'm grateful for the meanderings I had to go through to get to this point. And I think it, it actually does add up into the kinds of work that I do and that you do as well. Awesome, awesome. So I'm just going to kick this in. Mm -hmm. I know when I look at your name, I can't really figure out what part of Nigeria. I see like an evil middle name. Yes. I used to think maybe you were from the northern part of the country. So <laughs> a little explanation as to the last name, because I've never heard that one before. Right. So I, I always lived in the north in Nigeria. I, you know, I grew up in, I was born in Lagos. Mm -hmm. So my, I had a lot of Yoruba oh. around me. In fact, when I was born, the midwife that gave birth to me, <laughs> Mama Afis, our neighbor, named me Abiodun even before I beared any name whatsoever. So Abiodun was my name as a kid. <laughs> and then we moved to the north. We moved to Abuja. And I grew up in the north. I learned Hausa. I grew up with the Hausa culture. I did up to secondary school, university in the northern part. Um, but I am Igbo. My name is Okechuku. I'm fully Igbo. Both parents are from... Uh, you know, from Eastern Nigeria. I grew up within Igbo culture, um, you know, instead of the entire full culture, rite of passage and everything. So I, I consider myself 
like a palette of different aspects of Nigeria. Well yes, born by <laughs> Yoruba midwives, grew up in the you know, Northern Hausa uh, culture, but raised by very deeply proud Igbo parents. So it's a mix of everything in one. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that because I always want that. So yeah, <laughs> now I know. So now we talked about how at first it wasn't, law wasn't like, what you thought about when you were growing up, but one way or the other, you find yourself in law. Now, with law, there's so many diverse fields. How did you come up with, you know what, I want to do human rights law. That's the aspect that I want to uh, go into. And I know that also in your uh, bio, you talked, uh, it was about artificial intelligence as well, and you do research on that. How do you merge those two? Like, just give us a little bit. Great. Um, I think what motivated me to be a lawyer was pretty much the human rights issues I saw growing up, the inequities, the inequalities, the injustices um, in Nigeria. You know, even the way the law treated women as second-class citizens, you know, the tensions. The, there were just a lot of social justice issues that I lived every single day <clears throat> mm -hmm. and I wanted to change. And every time I would complain, my parents would be like, well, then, you know, fight for justice or, you know, go, you know, go become a lawyer. I just, the idea of a lawyer in my head was still painted by the men I saw in front of the magistrate court um, standing and those criminals were begging them for representation and they would still ask them for money. And I was like, this people must be wicked. Uh, but then my parents were like, there are all kinds of lawyers, you know, there are different types of lawyers. And even though I was a creative child, I could write, I could do a lot of things with my hands. Um, I also enjoyed sports. My parents, typical Nigerian parents, were like, yeah, not going to be a basketballer. We're having a basketball. My dear, you must go to school. You must do law, engineering, or medicine. medicine. <laughs> so I had to do law, and I fell in love with it, to be honest with you. Even while I was studying law, all my examples in class, the projects I did were all human rights-centric. So my natural inclination for social justice and activism was what fueled my passion for human rights. In fact, I was also doing a radio show in nigeria to sustain my legal education as well um so that's how i sort of casted myself into human rights and it's been so rewarding and it's not like i have always done human rights i've done a bit of corporate law i've done worked in government but it did not give me fulfillment like you know like human rights cases would give you right you can't put a money to the joy someone gets by you know advancing and you know making sure that their rights are respected and promoted for the artificial intelligence part, um, I had already come, I think I was already come to Canada by then, and I went for a conference in China, which was called the Annual Meeting of New Champions. And in that conference, it was like the foremost display of new technology. And of all the fascinating projects I saw there in terms of like blockchain technology, nanotechnology, quantum computing, machine learning, all these really high tech systems, I kept wondering the impact on human, like on our human rights and our human welfare. And at that time in 2016, nobody was having conversations in this regard. And every time I would speak about the human rights issues, they'd be like, oh, we never thought of that. Even to the technologists who were developing it, I would ask them about how representative was your data, who trained the systems, what are some of the risks you see? And they always miss some of the key core human rights issues and then i was like you know what maybe this is a good opportunity to venture into this and so i've been researching um the impact of artificial intelligence on human rights um now i'm focused on the impact on african populations and african people um so yeah that's how i yeah that's how i found my way here <laughs> that's that's awesome so um, as i said human rights and artificial intelligence is kind of unique it's something that you said you know what I want to know, I want to research more about this. I want to know the impacts on the African community. And that's mm -hmm. awesome. So didn't you ever think, because for me, once I hear anything tech as a lawyer, I'm like, I'm literally like, mm -hmm. what's, what's that? It sounds like a lot of computers and a lot of research. Right. That. So didn't that scare you somehow? <laughs> that... Well, yeah, I, I, I'm a lover of technology, but I'm not a technologist. I don't have a computer science background. But we don't have to know. In fact, even the technologies themselves don't sometimes know how their AI systems operate. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to know how certain things work for us to know about either their legitimacy or the value that they provide. 
like during the pandemic, for example, we didn't know the ingredients of the vaccine, but we knew that when you take a vaccine, chances of having like really high complicated cases will reduce. We don't know the ingredients in the medication, in, in Tylenol or anything that we take, but we know it works. Same thing with technology. We, we might not know what is in the technology, but we judge it by its impact. So when we see some of these systems discriminating black people, um, maybe on, I mean, the, it wasn't planned to do that, but it does that. We have to question why. Did you not use black data? Did black people not were not part of this development process? And so dealing with issues of like algorithmic bias, technological racism, we don't have to fully know, right? We can we can address it or have a conversation about it without knowing how the technology works. But yes, AI is scary. Till now, we're still. <laughs> We're still struggling with a, a, a general definition of what AI is. We have not even resolved that. And people are talking about AI systems doing some really mind-blowing things. So I think, uh, I mean, for me, the point is to see that we are all engaged in the process. Lawyer, social, don't feel like you have to know it before you can engage in it. We all use AI, or AI uses us, as they say, one way or the other. We are, we are engaging with AI systems. Well, using somebody. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good. Like you embrace mm -hmm. that uniqueness. It's actually a very powerful concept. So, like, how has embracing uniqueness, especially in terms of that AI, how has it helped to grow your legal career as well? Hmm. So. Um... For me, as an international lawyer, I always look at my role in bridging gaps. I, 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 I always say that I like to bridge gaps between people, between nations. I'm always trying to seek justice and diplomacy beyond a national level. So <clears throat> when it comes to AI, artificial intelligence systems don't work within specific countries. They're always like some AI tool developed in Silicon Valley, but used in 45 or 50 countries. So therefore, AI systems are mostly international, right? Mm -hmm. So um, for me, I'm always focused on ensuring that um, it's not just about a moral obligation, but we have to be critical in the way that we seek or analyze these machines to empower them with intelligence. Because when we, when we understand principles like dignity, freedom, equality of all individuals, right? Then we can imagine that this technology can serve us and not harm us. So for me, it's been a hugely rewarding experience to you know, sort of learn about um, what AI systems are, how they impact us, but also how it sort of does a lot of improvement in terms of my work as a human rights lawyer. And so I recognize that even me as a black African immigrant in Canada, researching, writing, working in this area, I am daring to be different. I am daring to break that stereotype. You know, I've been in a conference one time this is a conference in Russia, but it was a conference on artificial intelligence. I was not only the only black person, I was the only black person, the only person from Africa. And of course I was shook, as they say, I was very, I had a lot of anxiety and people were asking me questions like, sorry, where are you from? And why are you even researching AI? Do you guys have computers in your country? And I'm just like, yeah, you know, just my presence here is already enough so showing up at that conference and presenting my paper which was interesting because i presented a paper on self-driving cars and it triggered i would say it contributed a lot to the discourse because for the self-driving car developers they were they didn't think africans would ever think about self-driving cars but i had to take them through the trajectory of uh, industrial revolutions if mobile phones made it to Africa and Rolls Royce made it to Africa, well, what makes you think your new self-driving car is not going to make it to Africa? So you must think about African values, African ethos, you know, the norms that we take as cognizant for you to build your technology. So in daring to be different, I do the things that I have passion for, even though I don't see many Black people doing it, even though I don't see many Africans doing it. I just do it because I can and because I want to. That, that exudes confidence. If you have confidence in what you're doing, if you believe strongly in what you're doing, I believe you'll be able to like, go anywhere and represent. For a lot of people, that doesn't come naturally. Mm. But for a lot of people, that confidence kills that dream. Like, oh, what would people say? For example, you talked about going uh, to, was it Russia? And you're the only black person there. For so many of us would like cower and don't want to talk about it because mm -hmm. we feel like what if they shush me or what if what if what if and then we will not have the confidence to to proceed so with you would you say that that confidence just 
came naturally to you or it's something you had to learn along the way i don't even i think i, I would say i had to learn along the way but i don't think i've always been and maybe you share your own because i know you've always had experiences where you're the only one like you um for me sometimes i'm not confident but i do it anyway sometimes i'm scared i'm like i'm going to you know the, the the thing is sometimes like at that conference i was like if i don't present this paper well not only do i embarrass myself but i'm embarrassing the whole black race <laughs> in fact, yourself, <laughs> if i don't present well maybe they will not allow black people to come and present here again so I, I you know i want to do my best so you know i will be anxious and i'm presenting in front of these professors who are machine learning engineers and big professors and who's this african lawyer coming to tell us what our technology is not getting right from an African perspective. Of course, I was anxious. Of course, I didn't feel my 100%, but I've just learned to go with it constantly, right? Um, my father would say, do it afraid. Just do it anyways, you know? My father would say, do it and even screw up, but you did it anyways. It's better for you to fail than for you to regret not trying. So not like I've gained some confidence. I've just learned to do it afraid, um, irrespective, which is which is a risk, but I try. But how do you, when you're the only black woman in a space, how, how do you navigate? Uh, I, I would say, uh, for me, truly, I, 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 some people say, oh, you're so confident. But for me, I don't see it that way. Because if you know all the things that are going on in my head hmm. at that time, and how I'm about to like ask the ground to just open up and swallow me, <laughs> and then when I talk to other people, like, oh my God, you did it so well, and um, I still can't believe it. So sometimes, for example, if it is something that was then recorded, I go back and watch, I'm like, oh, really? It's not actually showing that I was very, very... Right. <laughs> so sometimes it is also sometimes talking to yourself in the mirror before you go on, on a platform, you know, mm. try to talk to other people about the topic, just get yourself a little prepared, psych yourself up. Right. One thing that I also do sometimes, because I'm always afraid that when I go to public speaking, my voice might start to crack. You know, that mm -hmm. kind of nervousness right. when you first right. start to crack. So sometimes I just pretend like everybody there is a whole, just a wall. I'm talking to a wall. So I don't see anybody, even though I'm looking at you guys. Or I pick a spot and I keep concentrating on that spot. I'm thinking in my head, talking to that spot. So I'm not seeing all eyes on me, like, mm. you know, what do you have to tell us? So that's how I've been managing myself. So I don't know, I think truly the more you do it, the more you learn. Right. But one important thing that I notice is start it though. Start it. And after the first five minutes, the nerves begin to calm. Mm. And then I just forget about I was nervous five minutes ago. But the first five minutes I can bet it my voice is cracking. <laughs> sorry mine is even the opposite like i've never gotten used to it even though i like every single time i do it people are like but why are you are like come on you've done this before i always have to talk to myself i feel like i uh, i will like talk to myself and then like you know pump myself up by reminding myself of the journey i've had to travel to get to this path mm -hmm. and the way that i'm trying to pay like i would remind myself of my strengths and i'll talk to myself like i'm talking to like somebody's talking to me i'll say you know what jake you can stand tall and show your presences you know i would encourage myself and remind myself of what it what it means to be there like in that conference i was like you know what this is what it means look at how much it took you to get here look at how much you had to do to be here so you would not screw it over you know i would it's not even an option <laughs> yeah not even an option but every single time I always have that. You always, you always, sometimes you don't even realize. And then it hits you like, boom, you know? Exactly. And one of the things that I've seen in the past is when you stand tall as a black person and you're staying true to whatever it is that you're passionate about, I find that you develop enemies along the way. Now they don't like you. Now you're too aggressive. Now you know too much. Now you're instigating others, right? So that had been my own trajectory in wherever I worked or wherever I had to. Because all of a sudden you become a problem to them. Mm. And instead of them to think about the fact that this person is trying to pass across the point and to be culturally sensitive, because sometimes the way we talk is different from the way like people of other races talk. So right. if you're culturally um, sensitive, you will be able to understand that this person is passionate, mm. not aggressive about right. what they say. So sometimes too, I try to bridge that gap of how thin is the life from me being aggressive 
can this happen? Like I just try to always be mindful of that gap and try to explain to people because I find every moment as a teaching moment, mm. something happens rather than me getting mad and saying that, that, that. I want to teach you. I want you to understand why I am acting this way and why this is important and why you should try, even if just try to see reason and try my own uh, approach and see if it works. If it doesn't, at least you try it rather than throw it off out of the fire evil start like mm -mm, it's not going to work, right? So a lot of times just find it as a teacher, teachable movement. Now, for those of you joining us, if you don't know who I'm speaking with, it's the almighty Jake. Yes. <laughs> small Jake, small Jake. With us the presence today. So for those of you joining, please let us know where you're watching us from so we can at least shout you out at the end of the show. Where are you watching us from? What is your name? Uh, if you're watching us from uh, places other than Canada, what time is it over there? Let us know. What are you doing today? I'm having a barbecue at the end of today. I don't know what uh, uh, Jake will be having, but yeah. Let us know. In the I, I intend to take a walk because it's quite sunny uh, right here in Toronto. So I intend to take a walk. But now you're mentioning barbecue, I'm beginning to think maybe I'm, I, I, I need to realign my plans. Maybe I need to, <laughs> I need to take that's going on everywhere. So right. Invite yourself. <laughs> <laughs> one of those, even if they didn't call you, because you know how Nigerians do. We just <laughs> oh, oh my God! I just had to say hi, even though you can smell the barbecue from outside. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about your achievements. So currently, you have two master's degree from two very, very prominent universities. One in the UK, Oxford, and one of the best universities here in Canada. You are also currently doing your doctorate. Take us a little bit, you know, into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, it's interesting because I never assumed myself as like an academic. You know, I went into law because I wanted to solve problems. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be very activist, and then in doing that, I learned so much. And then my academic journey has been piecemeal. So when I finished university, went to law school, finished law school, I went into law practice full time. I was working very like every day. I was in court Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Litigation, 10 over 10, always every day. And then I needed more. I would sometimes engage with people. And when I see their titles, like, you know, LLM, this one, OPD, da da da, I'm just like, ah. you know, and sometimes their presence just silenced whatever it is, even though I would know it better than them. And I thought, you know what? I've actually exhausted my, 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 my knowledge base. I want to learn more. And that's what propelled me to apply to do my master's at the University of Oxford. And when I did, I felt like ignited again with new knowledge, new strategies, new ideas. So I went back to Nigeria and boom, I went into at a much higher level this time. So this time around, I was working, engaging with government in terms of training judges, training like very high level um, legal intervention. And then after a while, I figured, you know, maybe I've exhausted that. Let me sort of do more. But I didn't want to go into a PhD immediately. I thought, you know what, let me go to Osgood Hall Law School, which I've been a very big fan of since I was in Nigeria. And instead of starting a PhD, I'll do a master's there. If I love it, then I can advance to a PhD. And just like I predicted, I went to Osgood, shifted my, my thinking, my dynamics in terms of legal research, in terms of legal pedagogy, in terms of law practice. And then after my master's, boom, here I am <laughs> doing a PhD. So it's been back and forth, back and forth. Uh, but it's been upwardly progressing in terms of advancing in my you know my legal journey so i've been i've loved my entire experience doing this phd i've learned how to do field work learned the dynamics of legal research i'm sort of trying to become a small expert on you know the human rights issues around artificial intelligence especially for minority and black populations who are the most at risk for certain human rights um like abuses with ai but i'm also specifically looking at how artificial intelligence can help advance human rights in as much as it has a lot of damages and harms there are ways that ai could be deployed um strategically to advance human rights goals so that's how i found myself here <laughs> awesome awesome so now i'm asking in front of the entire world mm. because i also as i said 
human rights is my passion. It's what I went to uh, to get my master's in. But I've never really had to practice a lot of it. So now I'm asking because there's so many witnesses here, and you know how witnesses is very important. For them. <laughs> Will you be my mentor? <laughs> <laughs> That's... When it comes to human rights uh, law, I need a mentor. So whatever you say now will be used against you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should be asking you to be my mentor. And I think we can both mentor each other anyways. I mean, you have such a robust grasp of uh, the Canadian legal space. There's a lot of work you've done that I I haven't... I still see my... I, I am in Canada and I, I you know work and school here now, but... I still feel like I have a, a, a lot more external experience than in-house experience. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's definitely. The, so yes, peer, uh, peer mentorship. Exactly. That's actually very awesome. So we yes. can rub up each other. So yeah. you have said it here now. Everybody <laughs> have heard it. Everybody <laughs> have heard it live. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So again, for those of you just joining us, Please leave a comment where you're watching us from. What time is it uh, where you're watching us from? What are you doing at, uh, later today after the show? Let us know so we can shout you out on this show. So now let's talk more about more achievement because you're someone that has a huge portfolio of achievements, you know? So I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, but is it Denier Scholarship? Right, yes. Like, first of all, talk us through how you got that scholarship. And then mm -hmm. second of all, Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> how this scholarship has also impacted your research and what it means to you personally. Thank you. So the Vanier Scholarship is a scholarship uh, by the Canadian government. They give it to PhD students, mm -hmm. um, both PhD students in Canada, international PhD students as well. Um, it's pretty much to encourage, you know, quality what they say like people who have excellent background excellent grades or people who have like uh very phenomenal ideas for their phd and to support them throughout their phd journey specifically they give you fifty thousand dollars for three years so it's like 150 000, um, which is a lot of money um but it does sort of help you through your phd work that way you don't think about where will my next rent come from <laughs> school fees um, and also it's a very prestigious scholarship um, they give it up to like 150 students every single year and if you look at it they give a wide range of from sciences to tech to animal science to whatever it is your topic is it doesn't matter um, when I started the PhD I applied for the first time I didn't get it it pained me a little bit I applied again I didn't get it it pained me again <laughs> um, but my supervisor was like you know what you know apply again and i think what encouraged me was other friends of mine who knew that i was applying and were applying as well they got it and they were like ah, if we can get it why can't you get it like you know you should be able to get it it's a very long process not long but the amount of things they require is a lot like they require three ref three reference letters they require you to write your research proposal with statements of interest your research impact a long cv there's just a lot of things you get to submit but i was like you know what last try and i did and then i got it and um it, it changed my entire dynamics in three ways the first was i didn't have any anxiety in terms of where money would come from mm. number two i now have the privilege of researching as far and as wide as i wanted to so i was like before i was thinking of researching just a small area so i don't do too much now I'm researching the impact of AI on human rights across the African continent. I've traveled to Ghana, Rwanda, Nigeria, South Africa, Ivory Coast, Egypt. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. enough to, to help me do groundbreaking phenomenal research, gather data, do field work. Um, and then the third and most important is that the Vanier Scholarship is, is almost considered the most prestigious um, PhD scholarship in Canada. So there's this reputation that is attached to it. In mm -hmm. fact, there's even a scholarship you get because you've gotten Vanier scholarship. Right? <laughs> um, so it, it's been a, it's it's actually been the highlight of my PhD experience, and I'm super grateful for the availability of the scholarship, the fact that the government even has that, the fact that they extend it to people who are not even Canadians. Um, but it's been very good in attracting talent to Canada to do phenomenal groundbreaking PhD work. That's awesome. And in terms of mentorship, I can't stop laughing at 
comments here. <laughs> I see Jake of all trades, Master of all. <laughs> That's <Okay>. princess. <laughs> and he still said, Prof, Prof. It, I'm not a Prof yet, so I'm, that's far, far, far ahead, but we're getting there. Um, but in terms of mentorship, one thing I've been quite deliberate about is ever since I got it, I've been encouraging lots of people to apply because sometimes people don't think that they qualify. They think, ah, this is maybe for us. I'm like, no, you can. Um, and I've encouraged people, I've shared my story with them, guided them through reviewing the application. And I think every year since I've gotten it, I've known two, three or four people whom I've sort of yeah. supported throughout getting it because it changes everything. If you get 150,000, that's that's you're you're good to go like you have no excuse not like to. even people that are working nine to five might not be able to make that in a year exactly so that's, that's a lot of help right and apparently uh naomi says can both of you be my mentor so <laughs> <laughs> and then one more here which is very funny I, apparently i have a competition I have to join the queue. I should forget about it. Join the queue. <laughs> that's, that, that's very awesome. How has this, now you said you got this scholarship. It's been mm -hmm. a great help in made you to at least uh, broaden your horizon as to yep. what am I even going to be researching. Now I have the funds. I don't have anxiety as to where money will come from. Now let's go back a little bit to before you had that scholarship. Mm. I know the queue is not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cheap especially in countries like this we're talking in thousands and for you coming from nigeria and thinking about the how devalued the naira is right now changing money into canadian dollars to stand here in canada must have been a very onerous and scary task so how did you think you were going to fund it before you got the scholarship in fact you you're so right talking about changing money i didn't have the money to change first of all <laughs> i didn't have the naira in nigeria to change to canadian dollars so it wasn't like the exchange rate was dealing with me there was nothing to exchange to be honest one of the good things i would say about most research phds in canada is that it, there's some funding that will get attached to it it might not necessarily be super enough mm -hmm. but you will have something to support you but it's usually not enough, right? Especially for those of us coming from like Nigeria or from like Sub-Saharan Africa, we have to put into consideration that there's no direct flight for most of our country. So we're leaving a lot to come here. And we have, to, I had to complement my school with two or three jobs at the same time, right? Which is not easy. So I was a teaching assistant and a graduate assistant and a research assistant in three different institutions whilst doing my study. So I really needed the scholarship to just you know and leave you know leave, just lessen the labor that i had to do in terms of surviving as a student not like i was complaining i was very prepared because i'd engaged with a lot of nigerians who had moved and they had told me yo i'm doing uber on the side or i'm teaching a primary school or you know this is what like they, i had a lot of stories and a lot of support right so mm -hmm. I my 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 like they say in Nigeria, my eye was not big. I wasn't looking like oh, I wanted to like I've arrived in Canada. Let me now live the big boy life. No, I just wanted to thrive, get my studies in check. But I kept applying for so many scholarships. I think I applied for up to nine, and all of them we you are great, but we regret to inform you. There were so many applications this year. We regret to inform you. I got so used to that. Um, that's why I applied several times. I didn't get the money, but I was like, you know what? Keep trying, right? You have to apply to so many more to be able to get one or two um that would be successful so it was quite i struggled with school and work and for a lot of us we have siblings back home who don't understand they're like you're in canada send money we need something what are you like doing? send money <laughs> you're like, ah, here we pay rent every month not like every year in nigeria here we don't have recharge card you have to pay uh, phone bills every month whether you make one call or zero calls that money will come out of your account. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of cultural changes, but you know, I was willing to sort of go the mile. So it was, and I have a lot of uh, uh, sharings to teach other people who are coming for the first time to say, hey, don't have your hopes high up, right? You know, start from where you are. Be willing to do, there's dignity of labor in Canada. So it's not bad if you work in a factory or if you're a Absolutely. gardener. If you have to do what you have to do and you would grow as you do, right? There's a lot of support academically there are resources there are lots of support you can get from most of the schools in canada so i'm really grateful for that but once the scholarship came in 
I had to quit two of my jobs. In fact, the job I was doing as a research assistant, they had to cut it by half. They were like, ah, you can't end so much whilst you're having so much scholarship. Then when the scholarship came, then I had the opportunity to publish some papers. You know, now you could research, you could read yeah. books, you could... I was like, hey, hey, hey this, <laughs> is, this is it. <laughs> that's, that's great, you know. For a lot of people, especially for those of us that are from Nigeria, because I can only speak to Nigeria because I've not been to uh, other places. I don't know what uh, obtains there. So, you know how we went to university and university happened to a lot of us where some lecturers just make sure that you don't get recognized for your work. For example, it will be every course from the school I went to, every year there's an almighty course that nobody can get an A, right? And they will say A is for God, B is for this. And they don't know that at the end of the day, this ends up affecting your results. So maybe you're supposed to graduate with the first class, for example, but because of all these kind of things, you graduate with a 2 2. And then when you send the result over here, they don't know what you went through. They just judge you based on that 2 2 that you came up with. Mm. They're not, they don't know you're intelligent. They don't know you could have get, uh, gotten better if it was a fair playing ground where the lecturers are not being so annoying and being so lordish over right. you. So, and what we know about scholarships from coming from back home is that oh, you have to have first class or you have to have a really high 2 1. And this has hindered a lot of people that had those 2 2. So right. do you think in your experience that people with a second class lower division would be able to obtain this kind of scholarships or any other type of scholarship to help them in that? You know? In fact, Fikemi, what you say right now is uh, the story of a lot of us. I share the same. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a little story before I tell you what I think could be a suggestion for other people. When mm -hmm. I was applying to the University of Oxford, they only take first class and a few two ones, as they say. Um, and so when I applied, I remember the school called me and they were like, do you have time to talk? And I said, yes. And they said, we're looking at your application now. This is the application committee and we are confused. How can you have F in one course and how can you have A in like, you know, <laughs> I said, ah, I had to exp And I don't think my explanation got to them. But like mm -hmm. you said, they are in my school every year there were one or two lecturers who just would never give you a mm -hmm. if you like come up with the in fact cram the entire thing and give them they, they will say a is for god b is for them c mm -hmm. for the best but students just, just... d for the <laughs> few others then the rest can share e so when they saw my transcript with a lot of color a b c d e everything you know <laughs> each year had a unique story i didn't want to sound like i was given excuse for the way my grades were you know when they on that call i first of all said look there are circumstances beyond my control that affected my grades number two it might not show there but there were grades that i got that were c but i was the best in the class luckily for me one of these lecturers who wrote me a recommendation letter i got a d in his course so they were like how can this person write your recommendation saying you were the best but you had a d and i said exactly right that tells you what the others could have been but I told them, do not rely on my explanation. Take me just like you would take every other application. But I want you to also gauge me by the other aspects of my application as well. Like, you mm -hmm. know, so in providing a solution, I, I've learned and I've told people that sometimes if you need to provide an explanation with your transcript, please do. Mm -hmm. Attach a note, attach a letter explaining circumstances because they don't, they're not with you in the school. A C there does not look so great in mm -hmm. some schools eyes and it's competitive right you must if you need to attach an explanation please do also if your transcript doesn't have where they because a c in canada is like you're a little bit you're not too smart meanwhile mm -hmm. in some places a c is like wow you did satisfactorily well so mm -hmm. you might want to ensure that the grade breakdown is available you might want to ensure that you provide some explanation if the admission committee didn't call me on the phone to say explain exactly. you know, that was I was not at the opportunity, but I still made my case. But I said, you know, at the end of the day, you know, judge me by the other aspects of my application, which leads me to my Vani application, which also had, I had to submit like my transcripts. And every time they say bring transcripts, I say, hey, <laughs> well, you <hello. laughs> see my, my colorful transcript now. Um, so you have to focus on the areas that you have appreciation. Mm -hmm. So for me, luckily vanier would give you a score when they're done they grade you for three things um 
research potential, leadership um, experience, and academic achievement. Mm -hmm. So my academic achievement was not so high because they graded by your transcript. Yes. But I got the maximum score for leadership. And I think I got the maximum score for like research potential. So um, you would focus on the area that you have high appreciation, right? So when you know that they are going to grade it by the scores they see on your transcript, I had to ensure that the other aspects of my application were not wanting as well, right? Um, maybe it was something I learned after I got, I, I didn't get it the first and second time. The third time I had to sit back and say, okay, what are they seeing that I'm not seeing? I mean, my friends are doing great and I'm just uh, at the same power, you know, with my colleagues. But I don't know if that was what changed it, but I had to ensure like, you know what? There are no typographical errors here. And then focus a lot on my leadership potential, you know, which most of us from Nigeria obviously have. For a Nigerian to get admission in a school in Canada, you know that you must have done maybe twice as good to have been considered because of the of the, of the disparity in terms of how we work there. And some schools here just don't, would not take anybody less than it. I, I've seen people that have gotten two, two or less and they accept them mm -hmm. on grounds of them showing um, some leadership potential, some expertise in the field. Or sometimes you'll be amazed how strong a recommendation letter mm -hmm. could go. And this is the last point I would make. At York University, I'm a teaching assistant, which most uh, PhD students are. A student of mine was looking for a recommendation for her graduate school application. And she said she has tried, she needs a third reference. And I said, a TA, what am I going to write as a TA that would be so, like, convincing? But I remember her as a student. I remember how amazing she was in ways that wasn't like other students. And I remember I spent, like, six or seven hours Maybe I was just excited to write a recommendation later, but <laughs> I explained her contribution in class. I explained why she was fit for that program. And she got back to me saying, not only did she get the admission, the admission committee made note of my reference, my recommendation letter for her, even though her grades were like 2-2. Two -two. And 2-2 two -two is not bad, but I'm just saying, just writing this person is a great student, they are great, they will be great to your faculty, but it's not enough. Your recommender should be able to connect with you and say, hey, this is how I see this person's capacity. Your recommendation can also point out the flaws. Like in my letter, I said, yes, she did ask a lot of questions, some of which were very, like, you should have known this by now. Mm -hmm. But I appreciated that because she was not asking because she didn't know. She was asking because she wanted us to trouble the simplistic nature of the way that we teach certain things. And I, I give examples and I'm sure you know, the committee sort of appreciated. So every aspect of the application, forget about the transcript, you can't do anything about that. But your statement of uh, proposal, your research proposal, your CV, the other, your recommendation letters, those things matter a whole lot in your application. Okay, so now you're giving us hope that it's <laughs> <you're... laughs> you say us, don't add yourself. You are the ones that should be writing letters for some of us. <laughs> you're giving us hope. So because uh, funny enough, when I did my master's, I immediately wanted to go in for my PhD at the time. In fact, I had drafted my proposal under human rights law. And the title was supposed to be gender as a sixth round to the uh, convention, you know, because it was a topic that I did, not necessarily that particular one, but in immigration, about refugees and all of that. And right. there were five rounds. And I was like, gender itself should be a ground because places like uh, in, uh, let's say, Iran, just because you're a woman, you could be persecuted right. and you might not necessarily fall under all the other grounds. So that in itself. So I wrote a proposal, like that was an area that I, I was so interested in. But then I came to Canada from, because I used to be in Europe, came to Canada, had my first kid, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to put that on my back burner. But I'm sure now there will be a lot of scholarly, um, scholarly write-ups and articles and all of that already on that. So mm -hmm. if I end up having to do my PhD, I have to look for a new exciting or interesting area of law that I can be yeah, then at that time I'll be coming back to you. <laughs> now, you, <laughs> you 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 would be surprised that not much has advanced in that area. I mean academically I know scholars like Patty Seller, there are a couple of when I was at Oxford, mm -hmm. I didn't do immigration law. It was not one of my elective, but I remember the conversation about 
why is gender not one of the grounds that you can seek refugee status on because you could be persecuted because of your gender the same way you could be persecuted because of your religion or your political affiliation gender mm-hmm. is like you mentioned in iran in so many countries the fact that you're a woman is enough for you to flee to save your life right so yeah. even if people are open to the idea of recognizing it um it's important that that is affirmed concretely under human rights law mm-hmm. and also respected and like implemented at the very domestic level so again there's a lot you can still explore there if it's your passion because the thing about phd is you want to do a phd in something that you actually like not something that oh this would be important like do so it doesn't matter like this is a very critical important area and we know that when it comes to immigration and refugee issues there's so many dynamics not only race there's gender there's so many dynamics to it that require a lot of more exploration yeah so, so if you, if you <laughs> want to go and just the proposal and you know bring that now they would even say thank you very much for coming back <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's something on my back burner that i would activate maybe much later so now let's talk a little bit more about you being a member for the world economic forum uh global future council how did you uh, get into being a member? Like, I've never like uh, done my research to that point. I don't even know what they do. I didn't even know they existed until I read your bio. So just bring us up to speed on that a little bit. So the Global Future Council um, is the brain trust of the World Economic Forum. So the World Economic Forum, as we all know, is a global forum based in Switzerland, but it's the foremost point where political leaders, technology leaders come together to talk and deliberate key issues that affect the world, right? So they have this Global Future Councils. There are different councils. There's one on AI, there's one on human rights, there's one. So the one I got uh, inducted into is the Global Future on Frontier Risks. So it's pretty much um, a council of uh, experts across over uh, 40 countries. And we advise governments on how to be resilient in the face of frontier risks that are coming through, be it things around technology or, you know, public health epidemics and stuff like that. Um, how I got in, I got a call from the World Economic Forum saying that they would like to consider me based on my work in artificial intelligence and human rights. And I was like, yeah, why not? I was super excited. Like, my God, this is very, very high level. Because when I saw the list of the other members, I was like, <laughs> first, I was the only, I was the... <laughs> Like, at the least, in terms of academic qualification, they were professors, deans of law schools, you know, like, just the big, big, big names from these countries. And then I'm the youngest, you know, on that council as well. Um, but I remember them telling me on the phone, like, you know, we specifically want your perspective in terms of coming from the global south, you being black, you being young compared to the other people, and the areas of work that you've done. So we usually had meetings every month. Uh, we would like come together, we would meet, we would discuss these very critical high-level issues. Um, and then we would provide solutions to like, you know, how can countries respond to this risk? We even made propositions to, like the G7, the G20. So very high-level work. But for me, just sitting in that meeting, hearing these experts talk and we debate and, you know, blew my mind and expanded my thinking. Um, and I remember, you know, writing a few articles around, you know, what are these frontier risks and how can we avoid them? And for me, I just kept wondering, my God, there's a lot, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of preparing the world for the shocks ahead. And one of which is artificial intelligence. Right now, I'm sure you know, there's a lot of debate around, um, we need to put a stop to AI systems before they come and carry us where we don't know they are carrying us to. <laughs> <laughs> so you know conversations like that are important but it's like how do we instrumentalize it like how do we make a resolution at the un for example how do we speak with leading technologists to say hey can we know what you're developing can you exercise patience in understanding this technology a bit before deploying it for like mass use and stuff like that so uh being on the global future council was a hugely rewarding experience and I even was so proud that I had, I, 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 I ran two tenures because they, you know, have the tenures like uh, after a couple of years. Um, so, yeah, um, that's how I got in. I think the, for me, it's just being deliberate about the work that I'm doing and um, being open to learn, being open to collaborate. Um, like my supervisor, Professor Uber, I would say, he goes, you're a PhD student, but 
we can begin to engage in what you're researching. So when I'm on the field and I find out something exciting, I can't wait to write a small op-ed about it, to jump on a conference and talk about it, right? That way I'm learning, I'm sharing, and I'm building you know, myself as I go. That's, that's awesome. So now, the power of representation, you know, it cannot be over, uh, you know, on, overestimated or overemphasized in the community, especially talking about you being Black, you are showing up in these uh, uh, different communities as a young person, really a young person's pers perspective, a Black man's perspective, a lawyer's perspective, all kinds of mm -hmm. into that. So now as a young, proud, I'll put that, yeah. <laughs> Black professional, like what should be advice or encouragement for people that are like black individuals actually that are looking to advance their career either in law or in uh technology related um, uh, fields as well mm. now very important i think for me i would say representation is not just about being black or being seen that is powerful but it's also about being heard and being understood and celebrated right um it is what i believe that is what um unlocks the doors of opportunities and that is what would like you mentioned dismantle prejudice sometimes people have to see a black person for them to understand certain things hear a black person before they can understand certain things so it's about we empowering ourselves and embracing our identities in a way that we can contribute uniquely tapping into our various strengths at the tapestry of our culture and humanity so representation matters a lot and you have to be deliberate about your representation sometimes in my writing i would use pidgin english colloquials right not that i just want to infuse pidgin english i would write in pidgin english just the part uh, and then footnote it to explain because I, I, that's the way that I, I, I see the world. I'm not an Igbo black Nigerian man um, trying to be something else. This is me and this is my perspective of how I see things, right? And so when, you, when we talk about representation, it starts from self, like you seeing yourself in the way that you are, right? In the way that you can shape uh, perceptions about yourself, the way you can inspire possibilities, the way that you can empower yourself so that other people too can sort of connect to you and you know, leverage from your tapestry of your own experience. Mm -hmm. So um, representation is powerful, very important, and we have to be deliberate about being represented and who we truly are. That's that's awesome. So uh, it's been a fun time. In fact, I can't believe it's been over uh, almost an hour since we started this. And for those of people, because people have been joining and leaving and joining, so they didn't hear us at first. So. Just to bring a little bit of fun and lighten the mood a little bit, uh, I'm just going to ask you again, like, is there something, tell us something unexpected or something very interesting <laughs> about you that most people don't know? <laughs> Let me see. Um, I think I've mentioned my extreme love for food, which is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what else that people don't know uh i'm actually an introvert compared to what people think i know i know i know you you are uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i think i spend i spend most of my time alone um does not mean i'm lonely there's a difference between being alone and lonely because, yeah because you can be around people and still be lonely i you know mm -hmm. but like i enjoy both as much as i enjoy engaging with people i also enjoy my solitude and i can be in solitude for weeks which people find awkward because I'm a very social person, right? Yeah. I love to meet people. I love to go out. I love to engage. But I also love my my space. I love being alone. And sometimes I'm shy to say it. You know, my friends are like, I have not heard from you. Open your door. Let's engage. And I'm like, yay. I'm so happy to be with you. I know. But when they leave, I'm like, yay. I'm happy to be alone now. <laughs> like, <laughs> So people don't really get that part of me. But, um, you know, it is who I am. That's, that's awesome. So for every one of you, I'm just going to shout out a few people. If you have not marked the attendance, just know that you are wrong because you're supposed to mark attendance in the comments so we know that you attended and you watched us. So I'm just going to shout out a few people that um, marked the attendance. Evelyn Umudi, thank you so much for joining today. Niger Lawyer in Canada, thank you for wow. joining that's our Nigerian lawyer representing us here in Canada. Thank you for joining as well. Datari Anene, thank you for joining. Okweyemi Fashoro, I appreciate you joining. Jolie Naomi, thanks for joining. 
uh, Dr. Princess E.K. Thank you so much for joining. Let me look at the other names that are here. Mujukwe Akere, thank you for joining. I really, really appreciate your presence. Uh, Olamide Aboyera, Lord, thank you also for joining. And for those of you that didn't put a comment, don't worry. Next two weeks, we're going to be having yet another fantastic show. So please make sure you join and let us know what you, what have you been learning throughout this process. Seems like, have you gained anything? Let us know. Give us your testimonies. So if people want to follow you on social media, because you're very active on social media, how can they follow you? I'm on pretty much all the platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, my name, if you search my name, Jake Okechuku Efodu, you would find me or at Efodu. Uh, most of the social media platforms and yep yeah, i'll definitely engage but i want to thank you uh the proud black woman that you are um i love how you stand tall and how you stand strong in terms of drawing from the strength of your legacy as a proud black woman and the resilience of the community and the roots that you, you know, that you carry i mean you embody pride you embody blackness in a very powerful way and you embody the legal profession as well so thanks for for paving the way for so many people to soar and inspire and aspire to do the same it's a pleasure to be on your to be here as a guest because i normally would be learning and like sort of learning from you but thanks for having me I, I thank you know. so much i really appreciate that for everyone we're going to give you the rest of your saturday back until next time keep embracing your uniqueness and daring to be different have a fantastic saturday <laughs>